Congenital hip dislocation or developmental dysplasia of the hip in kids. Hip is a ball and socket joint consists of the acetabulum and the femoral head. The surface anatomy of the acetabulum is characterized by its three major components, ilium, ischium, and pubis. At skeletal maturity, these three bones fuse into one at the central triradiate cartilage. The outer articular margin of the acetabulum is continuous with the labrum. The fibrocartilaginous labrum, together with the transverse acetabular ligament, forms a complete ring around the acetabulum which is largely fully formed and developed at birth. The capsule of the hip joint attaches to the edge of the acetabulum proximally. Distally, it attaches to the intertrochanteric line anteriorly and the femoral neck posteriorly. Acetabulum and femoral head development are intimately related. The normal concavity of the acetabulum develops in response to the presence of a concentric femoral head. Developmental dysplasia of the hip affects the immature hip of the infant and consists in abnormal development of the hip joint resulting in incongruent relationship of the femoral head to the acetabulum. In simpler terms, developmental dysplasia of the hip is a condition where the ball part of your thigh bone doesn't sit in the socket properly, leading to it being shallow so that the hip socket doesn't fully cover the femoral head. This makes the joint less stable and causes dislocation. In addition, changes occurs in shape, size and orientation in both femoral head and acetabulum. And if left untreated can lead to issues walking, extremely painful hips, and osteoarthritis by young adulthood. The reported incidence of developmental dysplasia of the hip varies between 1.5 and 20 per 1,000 births with the majority of abnormal hips resolving spontaneously within two to eight weeks. Developmental dysplasia of the hip affects girls more than boys. And it is more common among babies born into families with a history of developmental dysplasia of the hip. The left hip is affected three times more often than the right. It can also affect both hips. The exact causes of DDH are not always known. Hip instability might appear after birth in babies who were in the breech position for an extended period of time before delivery. Any physical limitation, for example oligohydramnios or twins, in utero can contribute to DDH. 6 out of 10 cases of hip dysplasia occur in firstborn children. It may be because a mother's womb is tighter during her first pregnancy, which can sometimes restrict fetal movement. Improper swaddling may also contribute to DDH when an infant's legs are swaddled in a straight close position. DDH can occur in otherwise healthy children, or it can be associated with specific conditions or syndromes including neuromuscular diseases, such as cerebral palsy, hyperlaxity, commonly seen in Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan syndromes, skeletal dysplasia, a grouping of disorders that affect how children's bones grow. It can be hard to detect hip dysplasia because it is a silent condition. It won't cause your little one to cry in pain and doesn't typically prevent babies from learning to walk. Hip dysplasia in babies is often discovered at or soon after birth during routine wellness exams. The severity may vary from mere dysplasia where the acetabular cavity is shallow but the femoral head is within it. Or subluxation, the femoral head is dislocated from its normal anatomical position, but still maintains some contact with the acetabular cavity. Or dislocation where there is no contact between the femoral head and the acetabular cavity. If the child's symptoms are mild, it can go unnoticed during infancy and childhood. In some cases, it might worsen, causing hip pain later in life.
When this occurs, we refer to the condition as adolescent hip dysplasia. There is a rare condition called teratologic hip dislocation. Occurs in 1-2% of perinatal hip dislocations. It is associated with arthrogryposis, chromosomal abnormalities, and others. Teratological dislocation is produced during the first months of intrauterine life. At birth the joint reduction will be impossible. There are few things that you as a parent may also notice at home that could indicate hip dysplasia. If you notice any of the following, be sure to bring it up with your pediatrician to check out. You may notice that when your baby is laying on their tummy that one buttock crease is lower than the other. Asymmetrical buttock creases can suggest hip dysplasia in some cases, but can also be a normal finding. When changing your baby's diaper or moving their legs, you may feel a click in their hip. This can also be a normal finding, but can also be an indicator of hip dysplasia. You might have difficulty putting diapers on them because their hips have a limited range of motion and can't fully spread. You may notice that one leg seems longer than the other. This can be an indication of hip dysplasia. After learning to walk, a waddling type gait and an exaggerated sway back becomes noticeable. Talk with your pediatrician if you have concerns. Physical Examination The ideal situation is to perform the examination in the maternity ward, or within the first few days of life. The examination should clearly include taking the history, to assess the risk factors and antecedents, as mentioned earlier, in order to draw up the diagnosis. Signs and symptoms vary by age group. Among newborns and infants younger than 3 months, the diagnosis of DDH is eminently clinical and is made using the Ortolani and Barlow maneuvers. Barlow's sign is a maneuver to provoke dislocation of an unstable hip. With the child in dorsal decubitus, the thigh is kept at right angles to the trunk, in a position of adduction. In Barlow's test, the upper part of the femur is kept between the index and middle fingers, above the greater trochanter, and the thumb is kept in the inguinal region. Force is exerted by the child's knee vertically to the hip, in an effort to dislocate the femoral head from inside the acetabulum. If the joint is dislocated, a palpable clunk is noticed as the head slides out of its place. Ortolani's sign is exactly the opposite. It is a test for dislocated hip reduction. When newborn with a dislocated hip joint is examined, the femoral head is reduced into the acetabulum through the maneuver. The maneuver is performed with the child in dorsal decubitus with the hips and knees in the position of 90 degrees flexion, and the thighs in adduction with slight internal rotation. In making a hip abduction movement, possibly accompanied by slight external rotation of the thighs, a palpable clunk is noticed as the head slides into its place. Sometimes there may even be an audible sign of this protrusion. Such cases are thus said to present a positive Ortolani sign. One hip is examined at a time, with the other hip well stabilized, in a position of slight abduction. Between 3 and 6 months of age, hip reduction in conscious children may become difficult. For this reason, it is uncommon to find children with a positive Ortolani sign in this age group. The examiner should also bear in mind that if children present cracking noises at the time of undergoing the physical examination, this may not be due to an unstable or dislocated hip. Another later sign is Galeazzi's sign. With the child lying down with flexed knees, they will not be at the same height. This denotes a difference in length between the lower limbs. This sign will clearly be more evident in unilateral cases. From 3 months to 1 year. We find limitations in hip abduction. And leg length discrepancy. 
older than greater than one year child. We find pelvic obliquity. Lumbar lordosis in response to hip contractures resulting from bilateral dislocations in a child of walking age. Trendelenburg gait that results from abductor muscles insufficiency in the affected side. As I have mentioned before, since DDH is a common congenital abnormality, all newborns must be screened by physical examination. For children with apparent risk factors of developmental dysplasia of the hip with or without clinical features of DDH, often need additional testing to confirm it, including ultrasound. This test is recommended for infants 4 months and younger, because the hip is still predominantly cartilage and unable to be seen clearly on other scans. Ultrasound is necessary to make the diagnosis if the physical exam is positive or when hip dysplasia is suspected. We recommend an ultrasound study at 6 weeks in patients who are considered high risk, such as family history or breach presentation despite normal examination. It is also used for monitoring of reduction during pavlic harness treatment. It allows view of bony acetabular anatomy, femoral head, labrum, ligamentum trees, and hip capsule. There are angles that are measured during the examination. The one that is used the most to help guide treatment is the alpha angle. It is the angle created by lines along the bony acetabulum and the ilium. This angle is considered normal if it is more than 60 degrees. Dysplasia is present when the alpha angle is less than 60 degrees. The other angle is beta angle, which is the angle created by lines along the labrum and the ilium normal is less than 55 degrees. During the ultrasound examination, the hip is also examined for stability in the same manner as the Barlow test. But the ultrasound is used to see if the hip is unstable instead of relying on the feel of the doctor. Radiography of the pelvis starts to be used for confirmation of DDH later on, after children have reached the age of 4 months, since the femoral head does not become ossified until the age of 4 to 6 months. In radiographic evaluations for diagnosing DDH during the first months of life, indirect measurements and signs have to be used, such as, Hilgenrainer's horizontal line, Perkins's vertical line, Shenton's line. Hilgenrainer's line is a horizontal line through the right and left triradiate cartilage. In normal kid, the femoral head ossification should be inferior to this line. Perkins line is the line perpendicular to Hilgenrainer's line through a point at the lateral margin of the acetabulum. In normal kid, femoral head ossification should be medial to this line. Delayed ossification of the femoral head is seen in cases of congenital dislocation. Shenton line is an imaginary curved line drawn along the inferior border of the superior pubic ramus, and along the inferomedial border of the neck of femur. This line should be continuous and smooth. Interruption of the Shenton line can indicate developmental dysplasia of the hip. Acetabular index the acetabular index also called acetabular roof angle. It is a radiographic measurement of femoral head bony coverage by the acetabulum. It is the angle formed by Hilgenrainer's line and a line from a point on the lateral triradiate cartilage to a point on lateral margin of acetabulum. Should be less than 25 degrees in patients older than 6 months. And at 2 years, 20 degrees. An angle of 30 degrees or more is considered to be greater than the normal. We will discuss the treatment options of DDH in children.